Hey everybody, my name is Tyler. I am going to show you today how to create code that will let you compete in a Kaggle competition. So what is a Kaggle competition? Let's go to Kaggle.com right now. Okay, so like here's, here's an example. Predicting breast cancer using logistic regression is basically a fancy way of saying we're going to predict something using machine learning. And they have contests like this all the time, uh, competitions. And these benefit a company like Google because they get work done. You can see over here $25,000 and they'll pay whoever wins it. So lots of people will compete and the best solution wins $25,000. So uh, people like Kaggle, even though, even if they're not trying to win, people will do Kaggle because they want to brush up on real world machine learning skills. And for me, that was actually the case. I felt really, really good about my machine learning skills after competing in a Kaggle competition. And um, I didn't win the competition, but my results were accepted as true and successful. And that gave me so much confidence because these are actual problems that you will have in real life in a job as a machine learning engineer. So when I was able to complete a problem from start to finish, it really gave me a lot of confidence in um, being able to do that. So uh, this was for the Kaggle World Bank document classification competition, which was back in November. This was part of a capstone for um, the Microsoft uh, professional certification in artificial intelligence, and it just sort of tied together all of the concepts that I learned. So step one to uh, getting into a Kaggle competition, like a deep fake detection challenge or Google Quest, the very first thing that you want to do is uh, do a Google search and see if anyone has already created a project that's similar to yours. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time. In fact, the vast majority of times as a machine learning engineer, you will not be sitting down at a blank um, blank page and just writing things from scratch. You know, nobody can remember that. And it's always a good idea to borrow from people who have gone before you and modify their scripts or even improve upon them to match your um to match your needs in fact that person who you're borrowing it from they probably borrowed from somebody else that's just how it goes you know we all stand on the shoulders of the giants that come before us and you should never feel bad about that um if you're selling it though or if you're doing it publicly you might want to offer attribution for instance this one you know i honestly don't know where i got it but i will i will try to track that down by the end of the video okay so uh, the overall objective was to do the Kaggle, Kaggle World Bank Document Classification Competition. Now what that is, is the World Bank has a bunch of documents and they classify them by several different categories. And they only gave me like the first six pages of each document, right? But it's 10,000, I think it's 100,000 documents. It's a huge amount of documents. And so I had to classify uh, based on those first six pages, whether the document is based to based on government or economics or religion or all of these other big world topics. So I had to train a machine learning model using one data set of a thousand, you know, documents and their labels, like saying this document is religion, this document is, um, I don't know, uh, economics. And then I had to apply that to some unseen documents and they gave me a list of unseen documents to test it on. Okay, so very first thing we do is we import our libraries, of course, NumPy, Pandas. Um, if you don't know, NumPy is for arrays. It's basically working with numbers like in a, a matrix or a grid. It's a lot. And um, Pandas is kind of a lot like Microsoft Excel but in code. So you can uh, put numbers in a grid and it's actually, it's like a heavy duty version of NumPy. Okay, from PathLive, this, this just makes it so that we can access our data in Kaggle. Like if you, if you see over here, you got input read only data, you can upload data sets. PathLive makes it so that you can access them and pull them into your script. Typing, I'm actually not sure what that is. Uh, Torch is PyTorch. And that is a machine learning library. It's a lot like TensorFlow. 
um, import GC, garbage collect. Uh, that just shuts down things when we don't need them. All right, uh, fast AI. Um, I had never used fast AI before this um, experiment, so I've I've heard a lot of very good things about it. It makes machine learning easy, and I think it might work with uh, PyTorch. All right, so uh, we install pre-trained models. A pre-trained model is a um, it's like somebody did all the work for you on a machine learning model, so you don't have to train it. I mean, that, they didn't do all the work for us on this one, but that's what a pre-trained model is. Okay, so Matplotlib is basically um, visualizing numbers. You know, like in a high school when you drew a graph of some numbers, that's what Matplotlib is. Okay, so we install FastAI. This took some doing because I had to install the, the right version of FastAI or it wouldn't work. Import FastAI. Uh, I say I have vision text importing everything torch vision I'm not even really sure why they wanted to import vision uh, because this this problem has nothing to do with vision uh, it's you know vision is you know computers cameras and uh, images and this this is just you know text data all right so early stopping callback early stopping is important because if you're doing um, deep learning uh, you don't want to train it too much that means it's overtraining, which means it works perfectly on your data set that you trained it on, but it's not going to generalize to other data set, other data sets. Like if I make a machine learning model that detects my cat, my cat is black and he's sitting, he's sitting on my desk here with me trying to get my attention. Um, if I overtrain it, then it won't work on other color cats. It'll only work on black cats or it'll only work on my cat and no other cats. And that's what overtraining is. All right, save my callback. That's just saving the model, I suppose. Uh, Hugging Faces PyTorch pre-trained BERT. Okay, so the reason why I wanted to use BERT is because um, it was gaining a lot of traction at the time when I did this back in November. Um, PyTorch transformers. Um, so the reason why I did this is because there's this there's this website called talktotransformer.com. It came out at around that time. I'll show it to you right now. Talk to transformer. Dot com. Okay, and this thing is amazing, and it came out in the news as being incredibly dangerous. In fact, they wouldn't release it at first because they thought it was too dangerous because it can create um, writing that seems almost human. Like, for instance, I can start a sentence and it'll finish it for me with a couple of paragraphs. Like, uh, I enjoy Jing Tyler's machine learning tutorials on Kaggle. And then I click complete text, and this is all generated by a machine. All right. Afterward, I wanted to learn more about evaluating variations on a compressed sparsity network and testing in a big data setting. Tyler taught me about Hadoop, Pig, MapReduce, and HBase for all of these purposes. This was great because I found myself rereading a lot of that material from other tutorials, which helped me get up to speed on what is important for these big data applications. So I'm excited to continue working with Tyler for the next two, three weeks to move the documentation forward. There's more to learn, so let's make sure it's all up to date. If you have any questions or if you need helping, blah, blah, blah. So the reason why this is huge is because you can generate text that seems, you know, human realistic. It seems real just by clicking on something. And that's never been possible before. So I was really impressed with that. And so this is a long story, but that's why I chose BERT um, because from what I understand, you know, Transformer works on BERT. So I figured it was, if it's that good at um, creating text, it's probably that good at analyzing text, which is what we're doing for this. We are analyzing text to see what category it fits into. I probably should have mentioned that this is classification machine learning. We're taking a set of texts and we're putting them into classes. And then we're trying to figure it out on new text. What is the class of this new text? All right. So pip install PyTorch transformers. We already talked about that transformer. Bert. Oh, by the way, these are these are the, the notes of the original person who, who made the repository before me. Um, let's see. Bert. Case uncased. Tokenizer. Okay. So we're going to talk about tokens. What a token is, is it converts a word to a number. Like, let's say um, we have, let, actually, let's go back to, oh, to talk to transform is closed. Okay, so let's say you have an entire book. 
what a tokenizer does is it assigns one number to each word. Like, so the first line of the book is, I have a cat. So I would be number zero. Have would be number one. A would be number two. Cat would be number four. And it goes on and on for thousands and thousands of different words. And so what uh, machines can't really understand letters, they understand numbers. So tokenizing converts all of your letters or your words actually, or sometimes even full sentences into numbers so that the machine can understand them more readily. And it also does like some complex, um, some complex manipulation on that data. Like it'll say, how common does this word appear in governmental uh, documents? It does it appear with this other uh, word in governmental documents, but how common is that word to all of the documents? So that's inverse document frequency. Um, we don't have to talk about that right now, but just remember that tokenizing is just converting every word or phrase to a number so that the computer can understand it. And like, it, it kind of makes sense. Like if you, the word cat, if you find a lot of that word, like we said, we said cat is the number four. If it analyzes documents and it finds a lot of the token number four in that document, it might think, okay, well, this, this document is about pets or animals. So that's pretty much how tokenizing works. Let's see. Tokenizer, this is, this is right here. Um, this is just the, the code that makes it happen. Okay, so it's really important to split your data into two parts. Uh, training and validation, or you can call um, training and testing data. So what that means is it's like, you know, like if you, if you have a really smart kid in a classroom and you have like a hundred questions, right? So what you do is you give, you give that kid like maybe 70 of the questions and you say, look, uh, learn how to answer these questions and you'll be quizzed on it tomorrow. So that that kid, he takes all the questions, he learns the answers to them, or maybe you give the answers to him, and he learns those answers, and then the next day you give him a test. And you don't test him on those same questions, because that would be kind of cheating, because he could have just memorized the answers, and he wouldn't be using his logic, you know, he wouldn't be using his brain. So you give him 30 new questions that he hasn't seen, and you see how he does on those 30 new questions. If he does really bad, then you have to go back and train him again. So that's why you split your data into training and testing. Okay, sklearn is scikit-learn. Um, so I guess we're using scikit-learn. In scikit-learn, you can do deep learning with it, but we already put in fast AI with PyTorch, and those are deep learning frameworks for artificial neural networks. I hope that, sorry if, sorry if those terms are confusing. Uh, sklearn, you can use it for deep neural networks, I think, but for right now, they're just sort of it, using it as a processing tool. Right now, they're just using scikit-learn to split the data into training and test. Um, all of this is just kind of nonsense. It's just saying, okay, what is the what is the name of the file that we're going to be working with? And Kaggle is a little bit frustrating because you have to, they don't tell you what the directory is for your data set that you uploaded, you have to kind of figure it out yourself, which can be a little bit uh, frustrating. So PD is pandas, like we talked about, it's kind of like Microsoft Excel, but in, you know, command line. So when we do uh, full train data is PD, that's a data frame. So it's kind of like an Excel spreadsheet. And then you do dot shape, and that will show you the shape of it. It'll say, you know, 10,000 columns by, you know, 15 rows or whatever. I think it was like 24 rows in this one. So uh, NLTK is Natural Language Toolkit. And what that means is it is a program that you use to help a computer understand words. Um, so what we're doing right now is called pre-processing. What we're doing is we are uh, removing things in the text that don't really matter and that might make it confusing for the computer in this point, like stop words, uh, words that don't matter like the or and or but, um, 
or I can't I can't think of anything else but just uh, words that you don't need like like I said we are classifying books we're taking a look at the first six pages of a book and we're trying to figure out is this book um, about government is this book about um, economics is this book about the environment and we don't need the word the or a or but in that text because remember we tokenize everything uh, the words the or and or a or but will probably be in every single one of those texts and it doesn't really matter if we have them in there for determining uh, which text is fits into which category so we remove stop words stop words are just you know um, words that don't matter that we